2014, there was a, a movie that came out that many of you probably saw, uh, and then it had three sequels too many, right? Uh, it should have just stopped at one, I think. Anyway, um, it was God's Not Dead. Do you remember that movie, God's Not Dead? 64, 65 million dollars at the box office. It, was, it did pretty good numbers for a Christian movie, Ryan. Um, and so, yeah, God's Not Dead, it was called. And if you watch God's Not Dead, and I'm about to find out how many of you did, because you, you watch this, there's this responsive saying that they say to each other, particularly two guys, they'll come, come up and one will say something and he'll respond. And I'm going to see how many of you watch this movie. You ready? God is good all the time. Yeah, some of you did. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. That's, that's this responsive saying that was in this movie. Now, uh, please, I want you to hear me this morning. That might be true. It is true. God is good, and he is good all the time. But please hear me. This is not something that I suggest you do when you first meet someone in the agony and grief of substantial loss. True statements, and that is a true statement, true statements are not always the most immediately helpful statements. But it is a true statement. God is good. About seven months ago, I got a call from a dear friend. And he lives in Florida. He was just weeping on the other end of the phone, completely alone, without anybody around him. He had recently moved to Florida. He hadn't yet got a church family around him, and so he just felt totally alone, particularly because his wife of 30 years just up and walked out. There was no abuse involved. There was no adultery involved. There was nothing like that. He would tell you that he wasn't the perfect husband. And we know he wasn't, but there was no solid reason for her to leave other than she was just sick of being married to him. She didn't want to be there anymore and she just abandoned him and he was depressed. In fact, he called me and told me he was suicidal. It was really hard, you know, telling me his life was hanging on by a thread. And, and you know, we say such things and sometimes they come across as exaggerations, but it was dire enough for me, and many of you will remember this time, I got on a plane and flew straight down to Florida. And uh, the church graciously gave me a few days to go do that. And his explanation of this was like so many that this has happened to over the years when they're, they're, they're abandoned by somebody that they're with for so long. And it, it felt to him like a death. It felt to him that he'd lost his wife and it was like she had died. But he also said, but, the, but there's more to this too, because I also have this horrible feeling of not being loved, of being abandoned, of being unwanted. My dear friend, he did not want to hear me on the other end of the phone just immediately just say, well, friend, God is good all of the time. All of the time, God is good. He was sounding a lot more like the psalm that you heard Jeremy read this morning, the first lines of that psalm. You see psalmists doing this all the way through the psalms. You see these psalms of, of lament. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long? So I wasn't about to sit in front of my friend and say, God is good. Not, not at that moment, that's true, but not at that moment. But listen, I certainly wasn't also about to do what Job's wife did to Job when Job and his wife lost everything. You ever read the book of Job? Just read the first chapter of Job and just see what happens in the book of Job. Job is the book of loss, right? And in Job, you, you have all of these things that happen at the hand of Satan, and, and, but under the will of God, but Satan... He, he, he takes out Job's whole family, his whole family, his, him and his wife's whole family. And, and his wife turns to him and says, this is how you should respond, Job. And she uses these words, curse God and die. Do you know what she says? Her response is, God is not good. 
God is not good. And Job's friends come along. They sit with him in silence for a few days. And then when they open their mouth, they're saying, Job, you must have done something wrong. You must have brought this on yourself. There's some sin in your life that brought this around. And so, you know what we can do? We can kind of callously, in an unkind way, sit in front of people and say a truth. God is good and as, as if to say, get over it. We don't want to just say, get over it to people in that way. We can say, God's not good, which is blasphemous. We can say, you've done something which is so often just completely presumptuous and wrong. And so there are so many ways that we can go when people are suffering loss that can be either unkind, unhelpful, or just simply wrong. And you know what? I got on a plane. As I'm getting on the plane, I'm thinking to myself, you know, my friend is a believer. And as a believer, I know deep down there, somewhere there, somewhere down in his being, he knows that God is good because he knows the message of the cross. There's something there that he knows. And so, you know, the first thing that we did is I got into his car, we drove to a park bench next to a beach and we sat there and I just listened to him and listened to him cry, my hand on his shoulder and I knew we were eventually going to have to speak about who God is in this situation. I knew words were going to have to come at some stage while we were together, but just not there. And then to even talk about God's goodness. God's goodness. Some stage, that's a truth that does need to come out. And in this situation, you know, in our grief, it's very, very difficult to see beyond our circumstance, isn't it? To see beyond what is there, so painful in front of us and encompassing our life. To be able to look and see who God is in this, to see the glorious and true comfort that we actually can have. And this is the truth. Hear me. God is good. He is. He is good. And it's worth seeing how. It's worth understanding how. And so, you know, my friend would, after we'd had some of those conversations, he would speak those truths to himself, I think trying to convince himself. I, that's what we do, don't we? We try to convince ourselves. But that would come as a conclusion in his life eventually. And here's what I want you to see this morning, that we need to look to God for our definition of goodness and we'll find comfort in our life. It's where we define goodness that is really, really important. And so I want to ask you to look to God for your definition of goodness and you'll find comfort in your life. Now, we're talking about God's attributes in real life. Last week, we talked about God's forbearance and patience for our repentance, of particularly of besetting sin. Now, that's being a sinner. This week, we're talking about being a sufferer, okay? And so we're talking about God's God's goodness in our loss this morning, a sufferer. And as we looked at God's attributes, there's one place that we went, and that was Exodus chapter 34. And in Exodus chapter 34, you'll remember that Moses is hiding in the cleft of a rock, and God passes by Moses and lets Moses experience just some of his glory, whatever that means. But as he passes by Moses, he declares his attributes to Moses, doesn't he? He says who he is as the Lord and, and talks about all of his attributes, well, at least a, a good measure of them. And Moses gets to experience that. Well, before that, that, that happens because in the chapter previous, Moses had asked God to show him his glory. And I want you to see that in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 to 19. Because look at how God explains it to Moses. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, here's God's response. I will make all my, what's that word? Goodness pass before you. And will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will be merciful to whom I will show mercy. Wow, do you see what God is saying to Moses here? Moses, I'm going to show you my glory. And in showing you my glory, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you all that I am. And all that I am is goodness. 
goodness. All my glory, every word he uses, all my glory, all my grace, mercy, forgiveness, justice, steadfast love, even being slow to anger that we talked about last week, it's all God's goodness. All of it. Every attribute of God is the goodness of God. And that's the very first statement that I want us to understand this morning. The goodness of God is defined by God because God is good. In, in your loss, whatever is happening in your life, please firstly ask yourself, where am I getting the definition of goodness to start with? And the definition of goodness comes by looking at God. You see, if all of God's character is good, and he is goodness, and we think of his character. When we think of his character, right, we think of his essence, his divine nature, who he is, the self-existent, eternal, triune God of the universe. He is good. Now, I want to I, I want to think about that a little bit more. Somebody who's done it very, very well is Stephen Charnock. He's a Puritan um, from the 17th century. Just listen to how he explains the essence and nature of God, the character of God and goodness. Because God says, all of my goodness is who I am. So listen to this from Stephen Charnock. This is the true and genuine character of God. He is good. He is goodness, good in himself, good in his essence, good in the highest degree, possessing whatsoever is comely, excellent, desirable, the highest good, because first good, whatever, whatsoever is perfect goodness is God. Whatsoever is truly goodness in any creature is a resemblance of God. All the names of God are goodness, are comprehended in this one of good. All gifts, all varieties of goodness are contained in him as one common good. He is the efficient cause of all good. By an overflowing goodness of his nature, he refers all things to himself as the end for the representation of his own goodness. Truly, God is good. Isn't that an amazing paragraph? You need to, we, need, we all need to take that paragraph home and just think through it and just pray through it, I think. It's an amazing paragraph. Just every way that you can think of God every way that you can think of his essence and his character, it's good. Well, you say, yeah, but what is good? I mean, I want a dictionary, dictionary definition of good. And look, it's simply this. I think we could simply define goodness as that which we can give approval to, right? We can, anything, that we, anything that can be approval, anything that is worthy of approval. So if this is what we often mean by good, then as we think of God, we realize that God is only truly good if it finds God's approval, not our approval. It's only truly, good is only truly good, not God is only truly good, good is only truly good if it finds God's approval, not our approval. This is an important point. Think of your loss for a moment. We, we don't approve of loss. True? We don't approve of loss, do we? But if God is our definition, if God is our category of understanding good, that God is good, and that God is never outside of where we are or what is happening to us, then we're thinking that somehow in this loss, beyond this loss, is a possibility of understanding something in this loss that is good. That is good. That's hard. We're going to consider this in a moment a little bit more, but I do think that an important point for all of us in loss is this. One of the first important things for us all to strive to do the moment you are in loss is to align your definition of good to God. One of the first things you can remind yourself, align your definition of good to God. Do your best not to align your definition of good to your circumstances, to your finite limited view of your circumstances, but to God. It's something we all need to remind ourselves of, whether we're experiencing loss in the moment or whether it comes later and we're getting ready for that time. God is the sole and true definition of good. Now, I don't want to say that callously. I'm not standing in front of you this morning just saying, get over it, God is good. 
I'm really asking you to think that God is good and understand the goodness of God. And I know, and I know, brothers and sisters, pain and suffering of loss is real. And we find it so difficult to see beyond it and correlate correlate it with something good. But let's think about this. And the thing that I want to think about for the moment is in the confusion of a fallen world, do your best to resist defining goodness by your experience. In the confusion of a fallen world, which is where we live, do your best to, 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 uh, to resist defining goodness by your experience. And this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. We live in a fallen, cursed world. We do, don't we? Don't you experience that? Don't you know it? Well, if you're experiencing loss, you know that we're living in a fallen world, ruined by the rebellion of a sinful mankind. And yet, even in the face of sin, when sin happened in the Garden of Eden, it didn't, you know it didn't take God by surprise, right? You know, part of his overall plan of, of coming toward Jesus, dying on the cross for us, but not only did it not take him by surprise, but I want to tell you something. When sin happened in the Garden of Eden, God did not stop being, in, being good. God is unchanging in his goodness. God's goodness is providentially acting in a fallen creation. And, and you know how we describe, the Bible describes this creation? Actually, the Apostle Paul does it really, really well. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, he talks about us living in a present evil world. And what he's talking about is this time period ever since Genesis 3, mankind's sin in the garden, to when Jesus returns. All of that time period that humanity lives in, in sin until the Lord Jesus returns. It's, this is, this world that you and I and every other human being have lived in is a present, it's not going to last forever, it's a present, it's an evil, corrupted world. That's the age in which God operates in his unchanging good character. This world and the pain and the suffering of this Genesis 3 world under the curse of sin, you know what it does? It dims our, our sight of what is truly good. We can't even see the reality of God's goodness the way that we should because of sin and corruption in this world. And the only time, you know what? There's only one time that any of us could ever actually look at this creation and see goodness as a reflection of God's perfection. That was just right at the end of the creation week when God looked at his creation in Genesis 1 and said, this is what? Very good. No sin, no suffering, no disease, no death, no bloodshed, no sickness. That's the only time. Ever since then, we need to be reminded that we live in that fallen creation. And listen, it's not just that the creation is un under a curse because of us, but the Bible also ex explains and, and describes us in this creation. Jeremiah, the prophet, says that mankind's heart is only wicked and evil all the time, and we get that in other places in the Bible. I'm saying this so that we understand something, brothers and sisters. It's so important that we understand this in our assessment of what is good because we have corrupted hearts living in a corrupted world. Do you think we can see it properly? We can't. And I want you to consider this by looking at a psalm with me. We're going to look at Psalm 104 for a moment. In Psalm 104, the psalmist, what he is doing is he's looking at the creation. Now, he's not describing the creation from the perspective of Genesis 1 and 2 in that perfect, beautiful, very good creation that is a total reflection of God's perfect character. But he's, he's talking about the creation as he sees it in his own lifetime, what he's looking at in his lifetime. And he's still saying, this is amazing. If you read the whole of Psalm 104, you see there's glorious things that he talks about God providing for us in this creation. And you just look at it and you say, this is good. But I want you to see reality in Psalm 104 too. The psalmist acknowledges something. Psalm 104, let's read from verse 24 to 30. Just listen to these words. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures, innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan whatever that is, which you form to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. 
When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. You, you get to hear and you say, wow, look at this. And then listen to verse 29. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Do you see what the psalmist is saying? As he looks at the creation in his own lifetime, he's saying in all of creation, God is providential. He's looking after his creation, but it's not a perfect creation. You see, in all matters of life and breath and seasons and plenty and scarcity, all of it, including death, are in his hands in this Genesis 3 world where he is operating and he is good. What he does in the light of being a good God, acting within a fallen creation, is always good. Do we always understand it in the moment? Do we always understand exactly what he is doing in the moment? No. No, we don't. It, it, it doesn't always mean that we can just say God is good and it makes complete sense to us of what we're going through. Some of you remember this from when we were going through Ecclesiastes. We chose to go through Ecclesiastes the moment that COVID hit and we were all on stay-at-home orders wondering what was going to happen in the world, right? We didn't know. It didn't seem very good to us, did it? And so we chose to go through Ecclesiastes back then. And Solomon, who I believe wrote Ecclesiastes, Solomon is writing it as if he is the great philosopher in the world trying to understand the world that he lives within his own experience in the world. He, he uses this phrase a lot. He says, under the sun, living under the sun. So when we try to assess the world by our own philosophical interpretation of our own experience in the world, living in the world, and that's what we have, just trying to understand the world under the sun. And listen to what he says. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14 to 18, I have seen everything that is done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom, but to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also a striving after wind, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Here's Solomon trying to understand and assess the world by his experience in the world as a finite being. And, and what, does he, what does he see? He sees that in his own wisdom, in his own philosophical understanding of his, of his experience in the world, using his autonomous human reasoning in this world, he only ends up in madness, wind, meaningless, sorrow, and vanity. And you and I are in this world also finite like this. And, and it's a bit like going around on a roundabout. Have you, ever been, have you ever been in a playground with one of those roundabouts, you know, the big circle thing on the ground with bars on it, and, and your brother comes while you're on it, and he grabs it, and he, goes, he makes it go really, really fast, and all you can do is hold on for, for grim death, right? Because you're gonna, if, if, if you let go, you're, it's, it's going to be a mess, right? You, you, know the, you know the thing that I'm talking about? They don't really have it in playgrounds anymore because you're not allowed to hurt yourself anymore. But, okay, so there was this, there's this thing that, that, that he did, not, and I'm just holding on to this. And you realise when you're on this, you're helpless. You can't do anything. You can't stop it. You can't get outside of it. The only way for you to understand something from outside of that is for somebody from outside of it to come and slow it down for you and stop it and get you off and so you can think outside the roundabout. It's what it's like for us. We need someone outside the roundabout to help us to get off the roundabout and think beyond the roundabout. And that's been this world's problem from the beginning of time, from ever since Genesis 3. And so I want to give you a couple of examples. I actually want to give you examples of people who just try to philosophize about the world and understanding loss and suffering and death and all of those things from inside the roundabout, right? From under the sun. I don't know if you've heard of the term Gnosticism. Anybody heard that term? A few of you have heard it, right? 
Gnosticism is a belief system that was around a little bit after the New Testament in the apostolic era, um, just a bit after the New Testament time, after the apostolic era time. And uh, the Gnostics were trying to understand the, the nature of things in the world because they would look at the world and they would see suffering and evil and death and all of those sorts of things. But how did that come to be? And so using human autonomous reasoning, they would say, well, okay, well, if this is how things are, then a good God could not have created all of this because we're seeing all of this yuckiness all around us. And so there must be someone other than the good God, maybe a not so good God. And maybe there's a whole stream of not so good gods get worse, worse, and worse, and worse before you come to an evil God at the end. They, they use this concept called the demiurge. And, and what, it, what it was is, is you have to get so far away from the good God that only the evil God could create a creation with all evil, death, and, and suffering in it, okay? And what our whole, our, our whole uh, purpose in life is that our soul, our spirit, can escape the material world because matter must be evil and it was created by a, an evil God. So their understanding of the creator of the universe is that God is not good, through their philosophy. But there are philosophies that end up saying, okay, well, God is good. Let me give you a contemporary one. Maybe you have heard of uh, a contemporary rabbi. His name is Harold Kushner. Anybody heard of him? He wrote a book called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. Have you heard of that book? And, and Harold Kushner, he had a horrifying situation happen. His son was born with a, with a horrible disease and, and Harold Kushner experienced incredible loss in all of that. He experienced real heartbreaking loss and he came up with this quandary. I wanna believe that God is good. Neither God is good or he is sovereign, but he can't be both. He can't be good and powerful. And so Kushner wrote this book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And in this book, he discusses the um, he discusses the, the uh, book of Job. Job is the book of loss, right, in, in the Bible. And listen to what he says about the book of Job. He says, let me suggest that the author of the book of Job takes the position which neither Job nor his friends take. He believes in God's goodness and Job's goodness and is prepared to give up his belief that God is all-powerful. He says that about the, book of, the author of the book of Job. It says, bad things do happen to good people in this world, but it is not God who wills it. God would like people to get what they deserve in life, okay? But he cannot always arrange it. Forced to choose between a good God who is not totally powerful or a powerful God who is not totally good, the author of the book of Job chose to believe in God's goodness. Now, I want to put to you, I don't think Rabbi Kushner read Job. Because <laughs> that's not the Job that I read that God is either good or powerful, and he must be good, therefore he's not powerful. If you read through the book of Job, Job definitely does talk about God is good, um, and he must, most definitely does show that Job didn't sin to specifically bring that tragedy on himself. But look at what Job actually says. Job was complaining to God about his situation, and look at, look at God's response to Job. Job chapter 40, verses 6 to 14. Then the Lord answered Job in his complaint out of the whirlwind and said, dress for action like a man, I will question you. And you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? So obviously God is saying, are you saying that I'm not good, Job? Are you saying that I'm not good? And, and then look at how he then moves. He, he moves to a discussion about his power and sovereignty. Have you an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity, clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. God is definitely saying, you're questioning my goodness. Are you sovereign over all things to know what true goodness really is, Job, in this Genesis 3 world? No, you're not. 
There is no question that the book of the author of the book of Job is pointing to both God's goodness and God's sovereignty. And then look, Job sees it after God just shows him all of the power of, that he has in the creation. And in Job chapter 42, verse 1 to 6, Job's response is this. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Sounds like sovereignty to me, doesn't it? Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will, I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Does any of that sound like that you can separate God's goodness from his sovereignty? Job came to that understanding and he got on his knees and repented for even questioning God. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters, we have to be so careful in our analysis of what is good, particularly in our loss, what is happening in our circumstances, that we don't start analysing God from our human, finite perspective. So how do we do this? How do we understand more? Well, let's go there. Let's, let's answer that. How do we? Psalm 119 is this great psalm about the Bible itself. If you read Psalm 119, you read words like God's law and statutes and precepts and words and rules. They're all different words that are used to understanding what the scripture is. Now, I want you to hear the psalmist and what he says about God's goodness. Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Teach me your statutes. Now, don't, don't miss what is being said just in this simple verse. In our Genesis 3 world that we live in, even in our loss, God is good and does good. Okay, but how do we know? How can we see that? Well, look at the end part of this verse in this psalm. Teach me your statutes. Teach me your statutes. Don't trust in your own or anyone else's philosophies to try and understand this world. Teach me your statutes. You, you want to understand God's goodness in this world? Look in the word of God and see all that he is and all that he does in the scriptures. Look at how he has revealed himself to us in his word. Look at who he is and who he, what he does as you see what he's done in his word. We see the same thing in Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, the author of that Psalm, Asaph, he was looking around at the world. He was looking at all of this injustice, all of the loss, all of the suffering in the world around him. He couldn't make any sense of it. And, and to try and make sense of it, he says... In, in verse 16 of Psalm 73, he said, I, I tried to understand this and it seemed to me a wearisome task, right? That's like Solomon saying it's all vanity and sorrow and vexing trying to understand this world by being on the roundabout under the sun, right? He says it's a wearisome task. You, you don't get beyond it. But look at verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end until that's a light bulb moment by the way for asaph asaph's conclusion and by the way he he starts in the very first verse of 73 with of psalm 73 with his conclusion he says surely god is good to israel and then he goes and shows you how he came to that conclusion well it wasn't through his own philosophizing it was when he went into the sanctuary of god what does that mean well when he came into the sanctuary considering god in worship when he came into this, the, the sanctuary considering the atonement for sin that happens in the sanctuary. When he, he went into the, the sanctuary considering God's forgiveness of sin. When he went into the sanctuary considering, and in the sanctuary are all the scrolls, when he opened them up and considered God's truth in all of the scrolls in the sanctuary. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying, hey... I understood God's goodness in a Genesis 3 world through the word of God and the worship of God. I understand the goodness of God in a Genesis 3 world through the word of God and the worship of God. 
Wow. And you know what the Word of God even tells us? That God sends rain on the just and the unjust. You know, there are so many unbelievers living under the goodness of God today and completely spurning him, completely ignoring him. Now, that's not where we're going to finish this morning because I'm hoping that you believe and you know in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you are in him, that, that you have repented of sin and you have faith in him and that he is your saviour and you are in God's family this morning. And, and I want to tell you this morning that it is in Christ that we experience God's goodness in a very special way. It is in Christ that we experience God's goodness in a very special way, even in our loss. What is it to experience God's goodness, even in our loss as a believer? Well, firstly, how can we answer this question without saying that we experience all of God's glory and goodness in and through the cross of Christ? Brothers and sisters, today, just, just hear me on this for a moment. We talked about Exodus um, 33 and 34, right? We were talking about all of God's character, we start a definition of God, goodness from God, right? Looking at God. All of God's character is good, and we see goodness by looking at God and understanding who he is. Do you want to see all of the goodness of God's character in one place at one time? You look at the cross. Think about it. Just think through this meditation with me that... It, that I was, I was thinking through this week. Look at God in his character so good, in his character of humility, to become a man and die for us. Look at God in his attributes so good, in his love, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at God so good in his attribute of grace to give us an eternal life that none of us deserve. Look at God so good in his attribute of mercy not to give us the eternal punishment that we do deserve. Look at God so good in his attribute of righteousness not to let sin go unpunished. Look at God so good in his attribute of justice to punish our sin upon Christ as our substitute. Look at God so good in his attribute of wrathfulness that impurity must be consumed by his purity. Look at God so good in his attribute of holiness, otherness, that there is no other possible substitute for us to take our place. Look at God so good in his attribute of forgiveness that he places our sins as far from him as the east is from the west. Look at God so good in his attribute of truth that he overcomes every lie of Satan on the cross. Look at God so good in his attribute of glory to be lifted up before us in the shame of our sin. Look at God in his goodness, in his attribute of sovereignty that he planned it from before the foundation of the world. Look at God, so good in his attribute of power to rise in complete and eternal victory over the grave. Look at God, so good in his attribute of kindness as he adopts us into his family and calls us his children. Look at God, so good in his attribute of faithfulness that he promises that he will deliver a new creation without any suffering, sickness or death or loss. The cross is the single greatest display of God's goodness at one place, in one time, in every time, in every sphere, in every realm. And the only way that you can truly know this goodness is if you've turned from your sin and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know him as your saviour today, that means... If you're in Christ today, hear this. You're his child. You call him father. And you share and live even now in the midst of your loss in his goodness. So child of God, listen. I just want to end today by some scriptures and a couple of words. Just, just listen, will you? 
Matthew 7, 9 to 11. Just listen to some scriptures about the goodness of your father. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We want good things. We ask for good things. Sometimes we don't know what to ask for because we say, well, what is good? And I say, look at the cross and get your definition of good from God. What could be more good? What could be more good than you becoming like the very definition of good? Than you becoming like God? What could be more good? And that's what we get in Romans chapter 28, verse 28 and 29. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son you know what that is to be conformed into the image of goodness that's good and god uses all things to bring that about for his children we can receive the ultimate good and be be made like him now if you're lost today is making you more like Jesus, if it makes you more reliant on God, it makes you lean on the Father more, it makes you needy for God, then I want to put it to you. Think about, maybe convince yourself that a great good is happening. That a great good is happening. Now, I'm not saying that to trivialise your pain and sorrow. I don't ever want to do that. We have real pain and suffering in this Genesis 3 world, but I am saying that God is using this pain, even the heartache and pain of loss, to bring about good in your life, and it's good, because he is good. My friend in Florida had to grab onto this. We did have that talk. We got there. We got there lovingly, kindly, carefully, gently, patiently, but we did talk through it. One of the verses that I used with him was Luke chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. I just want you to hear it. Just listen to this. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten by, by, b before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more value than many sparrows. Do, do you hear that? Actually, in the Matthew 10 version... Uh, Jesus says, not even a sparrow falls outside the will of God. God is absolutely sovereign and he is good. God knows and ordains every intricate deal about, detail about you. He knows every hair on your head. He is completely sovereign. But you remember the words that we started with that Jeremy read to us this morning? My friend was more in this category. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? He was saying that, you, will you forget me? How long? And we do, we, we cry that out as like the psalmist in lament before God. We do cry that out. But I want to put to you this morning, if you're a child of God, here is God's answer. The answer from God from that question in that psalm is this, that I don't even forget a sparrow. What makes you think that I would forget you? Do you see that answer? I don't even forget a sparrow. What makes you think I would forget you? When you look to the cross, you see all the goodness of God in one place, remind yourself, if I'm his child, then I'm held in his arms of goodness and he will never forget me. He's going to see me through to the day that he's determined for me to stand before him in glory and I can trust him in all of his goodness because God is both sovereign and good. God is good. Now, here, I just want to give the last, last words, the very last words to my friend this morning. He wrote a paragraph out for us for me to read to you this week, seven months down the track of just reminding himself about God's goodness in his situation and thinking through it. And he said this, in the depth of my deepest despair, God's goodness was not something I wanted to try and embrace because I was losing hope that it even existed. My despair was leading me to believe my circumstances were of my making and not something that God could control. God provided wise counsel and I was encouraged to trust in his sovereign plan, which is inherently good. And I trusted in that. I embraced it. And I have found that his goodness is never failing and ever present, even when we can't see it. Aren't they good words? Can you grab onto those words this morning? If you are in Christ this morning, you can grab onto those words. 
He has proven it in the cross. He is good. He is our definition of good. Don't lose it in your circumstance, but grab onto it with both hands. God is good all of the time. And all of the time, God is good. Let's pray.